Now that the dust has settled and Endwalker has fully concluded with Dawn Trail just over the horizon, or already released for you, what better time to talk about my experience with Endwalker as a whole than now? In this video I'm not going to be making any comparisons to prior expansions, because I think that's been done more than enough and I'd rather just critique Endwalker for what it is and how it stands up on its own two legs as a standalone experience. I feel like this will give the review a more unbiased approach, at least in my opinion. I'm also mostly going to focus on non-story related topics. I'm no story expert, I simply enjoy it and that's it. I also think there is enough story critique out there already without me adding more to it, although I will briefly touch up on it as I think it's important to a review to at least get my opinion on it out there. So what better place to start? Due to the nature of this video, there will be minor spoilers throughout it, but the majority of spoilers will be in this section. So if you haven't done the Endwalker story or post-patch story, then skip ahead via the timestamps provided. It's not a large portion of the video, so don't worry. I found Endwalker's MSQ quite good actually. It had a really strong start thanks to Shadowbringer's post-patch MSQ setting the story up, and it didn't take too long for things to get real. With some really stress-inducing quests, high stake fights, and a satisfying conclusion to the 10 year story. Fighting Zodiac not even halfway into the story I'm sure caught a lot of us off guard, and then even fighting Hydaelynth near the end made you realise just how high the stakes really were, if you didn't think that already. And then finally facing off against the world ending Endsinger was pretty cool, although she didn't quite hit the same as the former two, probably because of the lack of connection, but I don't think that's something that could have been avoided, realistically speaking. Zodiac and Hydaelyn also had some really solid extreme variants, while Endsinger's extreme kind of just fell flat. Anyway, back to the story. Some stuff that irked me was the whole idea of nihilism, which felt a bit misplaced in a world where souls and an afterlife are a tangible concept, but maybe I missed something here. I don't know man. I wouldn't think everything is pointless if that shit was 100% evident, but I guess the life stream is a physical thing, and if the universe dies it would also cease to exist, I think. Anyway. Garlemald also just didn't feel like it was explored enough, although it had some pretty deep moments where Xenos takes your body. This felt so inconsequential and needless. I wasn't expecting Xenos to kill one of my friends, but maybe injure them if anything. Either way, we were in Garlemald for but a moment, and on the moon the next. And the moon, in my opinion, completely overstayed its welcome with the comic relief bunnies. And when we do finally get back, the new enemy, Blasphemy, were made out to be this next Sin Eater type of enemy, but were only around for about 20% of the story. That said, it was really cool to travel back in time to Elpis to explore the Asian civilization, and Ultima Fall had some really beautiful environmental storytelling. Although, like my previous annoyance, I did think all the scions dying and then coming back felt so non-impactful. I think I might have been the only person I know who didn't cry during the walk. It just didn't affect me. I've been playing since A Realm Reborn, and this game means a lot to me, but I just was so bothered by the story writing at this time by quote unquote killing off all the Scions because I knew they just weren't really gone, and I guess that just really irked me. Still, my own personal problems aside, I really did enjoy the base game story and Walker provided. The post-patch, however, oh boy. Initially, it was pretty hype. Patch 6.1 gave us our first look into the major villain, Golbez, and it garnered so much speculation within the community, which you'd love to see. Then Patch 6.2 had us face off against Barbarisia, quite possibly the best trial added in the whole of Endwalker, maybe even the entire game. It wasn't super hard or anything, it was just fun. It's difficult to actually describe other than that. The fight had a lot of dodging and movement, keeping melee up time was challenging but fun, keeping Cass up as a caster or healer felt really rewarding. It had something for every role, and yeah, just a really well designed fight in general. Then 6.3 introduced Rubicante, which was okay. It felt a bit like this brain training activity, but all you needed was one person to know how the spinning ring mechanic works and follow them. The rest was simple enough with stacks and spreads, the typical stuff you can expect from a trial. It was also at this point that the story felt like it just started to drag a bit, and it was becoming more and more evident that it was just FF4 story copy and pasted into FF14 with no real unique spin. Which I mean, we kind of expected, but again, they didn't really change much here. Then patch 6.4 came along, added Golbez as trial, which was actually pretty decent. It wasn't anything crazy, but it did have that same feeling as Barbarisia. Not quite as good, but 
good, nevertheless. However, my issues with the story still were very much prominent, and I haven't even played FF4. It just felt kind of cheap. And that leaves patch 6.5, which added the final trial, Zeromosis, which was pretty mediocre, honestly. The music was amazing, but the fight itself felt so easy. I mean, the fight as a healer was actually quite fun, but tank or DPS? It just felt like a sandbag, and that isn't good fight design. You do nothing but hit the boss, while healers are absolutely sweating it out. As for the story, I felt like it did a good job at tying all the patches up, but I can't help but feel the ending was kind of like this cliche power of friendship prevails sort of thing. Golbez did some pretty bad stuff, and I don't entirely agree with just being okay with that. He's a good character, but I would have preferred something like him sacrificing himself to defeat Zeromosis. That way he could have somewhat redeemed himself and been taken out of the picture at the same time. Still, it didn't feel bad, and it does a good overall job of setting up a potential future expansion. A bit like how the Warriors of Darkness arc in Heaven Toward set up Shadowbringers. So I guess we'll see. Maybe Golbez can yet redeem himself with the restoration of the 13th. Either way, that's the entirety of the Endwalker story. Although the subsequent patches actually had no correlation to the base game MSQ, I do feel like it could have stood to benefit from a few follow-up patches, just tying up the loose ends of the base Endwalker MSQ, like the lasting impact of the Blasphemy. I realise the role quests go over the impact of the Blasphemy on the world at the time of the final days, but how about their impact after the end singer has been defeated? I felt like this wasn't really explored enough and it had potential to at least be explained a bit. Maybe it was and I'm missing something. Either way, the entirety of Endwalker's story was good, and it did have the momental task of concluding a 10 year old story, but I do really feel like it deserved a patch or two to really conclude it and not feel so rushed. Maybe they really needed those patches for the 13th story arc for a future expansion, and if so, they've done a good job of setting it up. But that's just based off assumption, and we have no idea if this is really a setup or just filler. We also got patch 6.55, which bridges the gap between Endwalker and Dawn Trail, and I think it did a pretty decent job of that. We know the stakes are high with having to prevent a warmonger from ascending the Tyrell throne, and it even introduces us to a new character, Wu Lamar, who I found to be quite good so far. It also expanded Aaron Vale's character and emphasised that Cryo will play a much bigger role. Good stuff overall, and makes me hyped for Dawn Trail. Dungeons also play a big part in Endwalker's story. And although I won't go crazy in detail to every dungeon, I do want to make a brief mention of them. The dungeons throughout Base Endwalker do a good job at storytelling, and feel necessary to telling its story, which is good. I think Vanus Patty has to be one of my favourites, although it did have some pacing issues after the first boss. Its visual storytelling is superb, and the more runs I did, the more things I started to notice. Take the second boss for example. I had no idea this was just an elephant head that turned into this nightmarish spider looking thing. It's terrifying, but intriguing, and shows you the true horrors of the blasphemy. My only grievance here with the dungeons is just how stale the formula has become, with no sign of changing it. It's always four trash pools, boss, four trash pools, boss, four trash pools, boss. And that's at its worst. Ideally, it's always only two trash pools between bosses, but some dungeons don't allow you to do more than one pull, which doesn't feel great. But that's not the point. I wish they would change up this formula a little bit every once in a while. Like maybe a dungeon that gives us four bosses, but no trash pools. Or maybe a dungeon that gives us a mini boss serving as one of the trash pools between a boss. There are many ways they could do this to change up the formula and not extend the typical duration of a dungeon run. It just seems that the developers are too afraid to try something new in this department. And it's a bit of a shame, so I have to give criticism here. As for the patch dungeons, not much more to mention. Same formula, good storytelling in its environments, but something that kind of irks me in these post-patch dungeons is just how much easier they are than the base MSQ ones. Why? Well, obviously because of gear, and it's way harder to balance around being max level. But still, I wish the patch dungeons had a little bit more going for them in terms of damage and punishment, because it just feels odd that I have a more challenging time leveling in Endwalker than I do during the endgame dungeons. You could argue it's always been this way, but I'm trying to stay only on Endwalker here. That's enough about dungeons and stories though, let's talk about something more within my field of expertise, the raiding. I'm going to focus on savage raiding in this section and will mostly ignore the normal modes, although the gameplay will be most likely normal modes because I'm stupid and never locally saved my clears, lesson learned for Dawn Trail I guess. Either way, 
Pandemonium is an interesting piece of content. And again, I'm no story expert and I will mostly be focusing on fight design here, but it has to be said that not only is Pandemonium a rate here, but it's also majorly integral to the plot of Endwalker and explores the story of the Asians even further. Although this doesn't eliminate my previous grievances with the main scenario feeling rushed, it does provide some much needed answers the MSQ left us wondering with. Still, let's talk encounters. The overall fight design for Pandemonium was above average. It wasn't terrible, but it wasn't anything mind-blowing either. Arguably the best raid tier this expansion was the first one, Asphodelos. So let's start with that. P1S had us face off against Ericophonus with his massive hitbox that is twice his size and mechanics that I, dare I say it, are simply stand and let thing resolve. Intemperance had only two players adjusting out of the eight, and Fourfold Shackles was figure out a signed spot and stay still for the remainder of the mechanic. Not the most engaging design in my opinion, and in turn I don't think this fight was a good representation of what Savage is truly about if it's your first time in Savage raiding, and they could have definitely amped up the mechanical difficulty here. Just a little to give you a good idea of what you're getting into when Savage raiding. Maybe this is a bit of an unfair of an opinion for the very first encounter in the entire raid here, but giving a false expectation of how Savage is, is not good design. These issues are amended in Abyssus and Anabosia for the first encounters, but we'll talk about that when we get to it. Either way, P1S being the encounter it was doesn't take away from how good of a fight P2S is. For a second fight in a raid here, this has quite a few mechanics to it, but they aren't rocket science to understand. The arena itself wasn't a simple circle or square either, and had an actual reason for being the way it was with a gimmick. When the boss casted Sewer Deluge, he'd change up the arena with dangerous AoEs, which would severely limit movement. During this, he would also throw some mechanics your way, like Campius Harma, a limit cut mechanic that needed to be handled with the limited space provided. The solution is simple enough. Specific numbers and shapes make their way to certain waymarks and either stay put or rotate in and out between each other. Or how about channeling overflow, which was a unique mechanic giving every player an arrow that pushes them in the specified direction forcing players to essentially collide with each other to stop them from going into the death wall, or other dangerous AoEs. These weren't crazy concepts to understand, but for the second fight in the raid tier, this was really good. Not too hard, but not too easy. Then we have P3S, and man, do I have mixed feelings about this fight. Design-wise and mechanically, it's fantastic. No obnoxiously large hitbox, so tank positioning is essential, which is something I love as a tank main. The mechanics themselves are buried as well, and make for a really good third fight in the raid tier. Take Experimental Fireplume for example. It has the group dodging two unique AoE patterns, splitting into two light parties, and spreading or stacking. Or take the Tornado phase, which spices this up even further, dynamically forcing a light party switch if you like uptime as tanks or melee, and it has multiple solutions to handling the tornadoes themselves. It's also the only fight throughout the entire Pandemonium that has an ad phase, but it doesn't feel needlessly filler. It actually serves a mechanical purpose and is a massive throwback to turn 12. The Problem? Well, there is no variety in colour in this fight, which might at first seem like a minor issue, but it really does take away from the encounter when it starts to hurt your eyeballs for such a long period of time of progression. Seriously though, who thought to make the Firebird have an orange arena with orange and red mechanics? It's a lot of orange and red. Either way, P3S is overall a solid encounter and one of my favourites throughout Pandemonium. So here's to hoping future fight design takes some notes from this, just please. Have some variety in colour next time. And that leaves us with P4S, which I think is the best final fight of the entirety of Pandemonium. In fact, I think that for most of Asphodelus' tiered fights, except the first fight, which Abyssus and Anabosia do a much better job at, but we'll talk about that when we get to it again. P4S has two phases. Phase 1 has some really cool mechanics to it. The boss does these two sets of damaging tethers on either the support or DPS. The role to not get tethered will have to handle the upcoming debuffs and interceptable tethers, but the tethers happen periodically, so you'll have to remember which role gets tethered for each set. So there's a few patterns to this. If DPS get tethered first and support second, then support will take the debuffs, but DPS will intercept the tethers. Or maybe the DPS get tethered both times, then support will handle the debuffs and the interceptable tethers. It's a cool little memory game and happens a few times throughout the encounter, even switching it up with towers instead of debuffs later on. The other standout mechanic in phase 1 has to be Pinux, which reveals the arena's gimmick. Four quadrants become these unique elements. Fire, water, thunder, and acid. Fire targets the healer for light party stacks, water is a knockback from the center, thunder is a proximity raid wide from the center, and acid gives everyone spreads. 
Two of these will always be casted together, and fire and acid and water and thunder will never be paired. It's always either fire with water or thunder, or acid with water or thunder. The other two that weren't casted first will be casted later alongside a cleave or a knockback from the boss. All of this makes for a very hectic few seconds with fast thinking and adjustments. There's even less room to work with as the quadrant being casted will do a danger zone alongside their respective mechanic. All of this makes for a really solid phase one that requires a well-coordinated group. Then phase two has multiple mechanics to it, no two being the same, but sharing similarities. It's done in a rather smart way. You'll handle towers and dodge these massive AoEs pretty consistently throughout this phase, and you identify how soon the towers or massive AoEs take to go off by watching which ones the boss tethers to first. Each set of mechanics is referred to as an act, each act having unique mechanics and solutions to them that overall make for a really fun encounter. It's a bit of a shame they didn't follow this same design philosophy past this point though, and to explain this we have to delve deeper into the Abyssus. Abyssus begins with P5S, arguably one of the best first floors in the entirety of Pandemonium. It's brutal, but rather straightforward mechanically, with a simple concept. Crystals are reflected and blocked off by the walls Proto Carbuncle makes. It's all about identifying safe spots fast. It also had the infamous Devour mechanic, which isn't as bad as it's made out to be, but one or two deaths here can make things messy rather quickly. And that's why I love this fight. It isn't anything crazy, but it is a good representation of how Savage is meant to be. And the first floor is the first impression, so getting it right is important. You could argue that it was too difficult for a first floor, but I'd have to disagree. The crystals are all about learning the patterns to find the safe spots quickly, and Devour only really has two types of patterns to it, so it isn't much asking players to simply learn the patterns, get good at them, and realize that that is what Savage is about, learning the dance. P6S, however, didn't feel as great. It wasn't bad by all accounts, but it didn't feel like a step up from P5S. Maybe that's P5S's fault for being such a good encounter. Either way, the main gimmick to P6S was Polly here, which spawned plus and cross-shaped AoEs and swapped positions with one another, meaning you'd have to figure out where the cross and pluses are ending up to figure out the safe spot. It looks hard, but really it's just a case of figuring out and learning the patterns, rather than doing the mental gymnastics in your head where the cross and plus end up. It also had Carcaxia, which splits the party into two light parties and gives everyone varying numbers. It's deemed the hardest mechanic in this fight, but really it's quite simple, as everyone has a spot that they move in and out between, to bait an attack from the boss depending on a number, and remember what order of who goes in first is solved by either remembering or just reading a macro posted in body chat. The last hard mechanic can either be skipped or just brute forced with by using tank limit break free, so it's hardly noteworthy either. Again, not a bad fight, but not great either. It was kind of just boring. It had a ton of downtime when no mechanics were happening, and as a tank, well, the boss can't move, and the hitbox was massive, so positioning was almost pointless, except having to consider melee positionals. Unfortunately, this is a trend that continues past P6S. Which means we're at P7S, and oh boy. I'll mention normal mode this one time, because this encounter was actually pretty decent on normal, but Savage? I really don't know what they were cooking. It's boring, and incredibly backloaded. All the fun mechanics happen at the very end, but prior to that, it's just bland. Nothing is really going on. Dodge some AoEs, take some light party stacks, take some tank busters, the typical stuff. There is a pretty fun mechanic about halfway into the fight low, which is called Purgation, that involves stacking and spreading, but with a twist. DPS and support each get two spreads and two stacks in a random order, so it could be spread spread for DPS and then stack stack, or it could be stack spread, spread stack for support. Pretty fun twist in my opinion, and the other thing is the group needs to switch the platforms with each set. It's a cool mechanic, but it only happens once throughout the fight, and the other interesting mechanics happen at the end, which just doesn't feel great, especially when someone fucks up and wipes the group at the very end of the fight because they made a lapse in judgement. You could argue that's just savage in general, but not really. Most encounters ease up a little near the end to serve as a finish line, but not P7S. Aside from that, it's also just another wall boss, which again is just boring as a tank if you don't offer anything else of interest to actively tank, like maybe some adds or something. Sure, it has two different tank busters, either a stack buster that is actually more effective to take solo, or a spread buster, but varying tank busters lose their novelty relatively quickly if there's nothing else to offer to do as a tank. And that leaves the final encounter of Abyssus, PAS. And this fight is actually pretty solid. 
It has some returning mechanics from turn 7's Melisign, and as a Realm Reborn Boomer, I really appreciate that kind of a soldier. It honestly does make me wonder why they haven't took a Realm Reborn mechanic sooner. There is just a lot to pull from. Regardless, I'm glad they handled it the way they did. We saw the return of Curse Voice and Shriek with a unique twist. During the snake phase, the boss spawns these snakes and you have to look away from them when they burrow up, then return a gaze towards them, petrifying them and allowing the player with the green debuff to kill them. Quite a unique way to handle the ads. He didn't just have turn 7 mechanics though, he had a beast phase which was all about knockbacks and raid wide damage, and a few other unique mechanics like having to follow the blue flames and figure out where the safe spot was for certain mechanics. Overall a really cool phase 1. And yes, there is a phase 2, a continuing trend in Endwalker when it comes to final bosses. Anyway, phase 2 is also alright. I wouldn't say it's on P4S's level, but it's not bad. Natural alignment is a really unique mechanic that we haven't really seen before. Although it takes Allegan Field from turn 8, which is neat, it mixes it up with two natural alignment players, essentially being a source of the casted mechanics, with varying different stacks and spreads that players have to bait by either going far or close to the natural alignment players, but taking care not to hit them. Because just like Allegan Field, if these players take damage, they'll deliver it back to the party tenfold. High concept is the other standout mechanic, serving as a puzzle that is really cool, but once you figure it out, it kind of loses its novelty, which is a flaw in my opinion. Because natural alignment remains a mechanic with plenty of variables, high concept doesn't really change much lower once you have the puzzle solved. The elemental combinations and making phoenix is again really cool, and the final part is a nice little victory lap and is prone to wiping if someone majorly f up, but it's pretty straightforward and easy to understand. Overall, PAS was a fantastic fight and Phase 1 has to be one of my favourite encounters throughout Endwalker. And that leaves us with the final raid tier, Anabosia. Just like Abyssus, I think the first encounter here, P9S, was actually pretty good for what its purpose is, being a good representation of what Savage is about. I'd actually go as far to say that it does a better job at it than P5S. Even though I prefer P5S, I just think P9S is a lot more balanced for a first encounter. The fight has the typical stack and spreads, but it does it in a unique way with elemental visuals. Fire for stack, thunder for spreads, and ice, which dictates how much of the arena is engulfed in ice. The boss always uses ice ice with thunder or fire and always enhances one of the elements to make them larger. Thunders need to spread further, fires need to stack out further, and if it's ice then spreads or stacks need to be further in the boss instead. Pretty cool mechanic that remains consistent throughout the encounter. It also has a limit cut mechanic because of course it does. The boss marks 4 players with numbers and 4 orbs with numbers, and leaves the other 4 players unmarked, only for them to later get a defamation spread. The boss is untargetable during this point and all that needs to happen is the numbered players need to take these towers in an order according to their number and go outside the group when their number is up to avoid killing the group, while the defamation players need to get the fuck out to the other side of the arena. I could talk about this fight a lot more but I don't want to drag this on too much, again it's just really good at what it does. It has plenty of AoEs to dodge, in and out mechanics, introduces a limit cut, teaches players 2 player stacks, clock spot spreads and light party stacks, gives you a personal responsibility to not blow up the f***ing meteors during the beast phase, and yeah, a lot of stuff you'll be doing throughout the tier, which is a good way to teach you important skills going into the next few encounters. So yeah, solid fight and I do think P9S deserves some credit for what it does. And those skills you learn immediately come into play in P10S, and just like with P3S, I'm kind of mixed with this fight. It's good by all my standards, but it's quite hard for a second floor fight, and that's why I can't say it's perfect. Either way, even though this fight was a wall boss, it actually was fun as a tank. You had to angle yourself in these towers so you didn't get knocked off the platform, and cooldown management was really important here with how frequent tank damage was. And that's something I really love about playing tank. My cooldown management being challenged, and not being able to just switch my brain off and kitchen sink every tank buster in existence like I do for most of Endwalker. It was however a very punishing fight, with multiple body checks. The light party stacks required 4 players. It isn't a set amount of damage, but rather a number check. If 4 people aren't within the stack, it kills the entire stack instead, which makes an awkward situation where it's actually better to just sacrifice yourself with the stack if someone in the light party managed to die beforehand. And the spreads are huge, which isn't inherently a bad thing, but it is quite punishing if someone is a bit late and they end up clipping someone else with their spread and then knocking themselves and the other player out. The mechanics themselves are really interesting though, and this is another encounter that is a gimmick arena, something I'm sure you've noticed by now that I'm a big fan of, if done right. It had things like building web bridges when the tanks get knocked to the side so they can reconvene with the group, and building a wall behind the group so they can survive the Harrowing Hell knockback. Speaking of Harrowing Hell, oh my God, did they cook some crazy heal check with this. And I don't hate it, but god damn does this hurt. Like so much so that it's actually better to just tank limit break free it, 
which probably helps the healer so much that it beats out the damage they'd lose if you were to use a melee limit break instead. It's just a lot of healing, and I'm honestly surprised a mechanic like this made it into a second fight of a raid tier. And that's my biggest grievance with Peter Ness. I love this fight. I just don't think it should have been the second fight, but instead the third. Which leads me into P11S. If you thought the body checks in P10S were bad, well, they're even worse on this fight, if you're unlucky. And that's probably the worst part. Anyway, the fight has two core mechanics to it, light and dark. Light infused mechanics give the healers a light party stack, dark infused mechanics give either all support or all DPS a two player stack. The idea here is to have two light parties and a partner, and that's P11S. I wish I was joking, but as long as you know these two mechanics, you pretty much know what the fight will throw at you. It's not a bad fight per se, but I seriously believe this fight and P10S should have been swapped, and it feels like a mistake the way they're replaced, as P11S just doesn't cut it for a third fight in a tier. Anyway, before I make this section an hour long, let's move on to the very last encounter in Pandemonium, P12S. P12S, just like P4S and P8S, has two phases to it, and phase one is really good. The simple concept of the mechanics in phase one is light matches with dark and vice versa, and this comes into play with the super chains, which is a fast paced mechanic with a lot of movement and somewhat quick thinking but it does still give plenty of time. It's fun, it's engaging, and it isn't always a wipe if someone f***s up, depending on what set of debuffs they get, that is. This phase even has a limit cut mechanic to it, and honestly, I find this quite fun, until I had to heal it, but that's besides the point. Either way, phase one really does show that even with the modern fight design of huge hitboxes, they can still be incredibly fun and engaging fights. As for phase two, well, I liked it. My only problem is only one mechanic is really hard, and the rest is kind of just there, somewhat being like, filler mechanics? It really isn't that much of an engaging fight, although it feels like it tries to be. Everything happens so slowly with plenty of time to figure stuff out. The only sensitive mechanics are Cataract 1 and 2, with Cataract 2 just being a game of hot potato, which is an absolute joke, while Cataract 1 is quite hard, but nothing crazy. You just need to figure out where to go with the limited amount of movement you have, otherwise you're exploding and wipe the road. The other standout mechanic for me has to be Pangenesis, but not for its difficulty, but just how overcomplicated it looks. But it's actually really simple, and just a matter of taking towers, merging with another player, taking more towers, merging, and then taking more towers. Which does make me wonder why they make it the way they did. In a way, the debuffs are necessary for the merging and the taking of towers, because you have to merge to rid yourself of the debuff, which also spawns these slimes, which tether to the players and need to be taken by the players who had the zero debuffs. Which I kind of get, but still, it's very busy when you're learning it for the first time, but a very simple mechanic in practice. And yeah, that was P12S. Overall, a good fight, really enjoyed phase one, and I liked phase two, but it definitely could have been bit more. All in all, I found Pandemonium to be a bit of a mixed bag. Asphodelus was by far the strongest tier, while Abyssus and Anabosia had their highs but also some serious lows compared to the first tier. It feels like they figured out how they wanted to direct fights in Abyssus, and went from there into Anabosia, which is a bit of a shame because it made the two tiers feel very samey. With multiple wall bosses and huge ass hitboxes, it didn't feel fresh like Asphodelus was. Maybe one of the two tiers could have benefited from a final boss not having a door boss, but rather a complete fight, to make the tier feel a bit more fresh. I'm not entirely sure, but I do hope that come with Dawn Trail, every tier has something to keep them fresh and separated from their predecessors. And that's just the savage raids in Endwalker. Next we have ultimate raids to talk about, so strap in because we're going deep. Dragon Song Reprise was the first ultimate raid to release in Endwalker, and it was goddamn amazing. It took my midcore group six weeks to clear, and the journey was one of my best journeys in an ultimate raid yet. Phase 1 served as an introduction to the fight and isn't the most difficult thing to comprehend, but it does teach you some important things like the PlayStation symbols indicating who is chained to who, so you know who to go opposite of when the knockback comes around. And the intermission with Honchfunt blocking the spear will unfortunately end in meeting his demise, but the great thing here is we will be revisiting this part. But the fight teaches you how to deal with this mechanic now. After phase 1, Forden comes down and we begin phase 2, and the neat thing here is this is actually a checkpoint. The only checkpoint we've ever got in an ultimate fight, but narratively and mechanically speaking, it makes sense. 
Either way, Phase 2's main stick is Strength of the Ward and Sanctity of the Ward, both mechanics that force downtime and require strict positioning and movement to solve the plethora of mechanics Forden and his knights will throw at you. Very cool stuff here, although my only gripe is Sanctity sometimes has cursed tower placements which make handling the meteors extremely sensitive and isn't something that happens consistently. In fact, the chances are slim to have the cursed pattern placement, but when it does happen, it just feels kind of bad. Either the meteor player will be a gamer and know exactly how much to move between meteors, or the group will just wipe and go again. It's pretty early into the fight so it's not a huge deal, but still annoying and inconsistent with the general flow of the fight. Phase 3 starts with Nidhogg doing a big raid wide and then giving everyone first in line, second in line, and third in line dives. Every dive drops a tower that needs to be taken by someone who wasn't just dived on. I really like this phase because it feels like a dance, and once you solve the dance, it feels extremely satisfying to pull off every time. It's a simple but fast paced mechanic that requires preemptive planning and makes for a real nice change in pace. There's also these multi people towers later and these tank tethers, and man do these tank tethers hurt. I think they're actually the hardest hitting tank buster currently in the game that either needs to be straight up kitchen synced or in Van Fruit to survive. After phase 3 we begin in phase 4, I phase. And this phase is pretty simple, which is nice because it serves as a breather from phase 3. The basic principle to this phase is red debuffs take damage, which damages the red eye, blue debuffs need to not take damage, otherwise they'll heal the blue eye. Debuffs can be passed around to other players to bypass vulnerabilities that the orbs and dives do. Once past phase 4, we enter intermission phase, and this is where Haunchfront comes back, but this time we need to save him with tank limit break 3 and keeping him alive with heals. Other than that, we do this normally like how we handled it in phase 1, after which we alter the timeline and begin phase 5. Phase 5 begins with Forden again and works in a similar fashion to Phase 2, but instead of Ward it's Wrath of the Heavens and Death of the Heavens. Wrath is pretty simple, but Death is the real deal here. PlayStation Chains and Knockbacks return from Phase 1, and the Earthquake, Lightning Spreads and Two Gazes return from Phase 2, and instead of the Knights diving, we got Knights and Dragons diving. Then we got Meteors to deal with, and then we need to finish Forden, but we're not killing him. We actually need to spare him to progress past Phase 6. And overall, I really liked this phase. Death of the Heavens is definitely a bit of a prog wall with coordinates ink who goes where with the playstation chains and whatnot but as strategies evolved it's become easier over time after that we enter phase six double dragons facing off against nedhog and helsvega and the deal with this phase is having to keep the two dragons three percent hp between each other juggle a debuff and survive past rough flames i have to admit i like this phase but i do think it's kind of bullshit how if Frelsvega manages to accidentally kill someone, it's a wipe, because he'll enrage and start one-shotting everyone and not taking any damage. Punishment is great, but this degree of punishment just felt bad. There's no recovery angle to this except get and go back to the start of the fight, which I'm just not a huge fan of when it's this late into the fight. But I digress. Once past phase 6, Fallen will come back down and steal the power of the two dragons we just defeated, do a bunch of raid-wide damage, and then turn on us after we just spared him. What a dickhead. Anyway, we then enter the final phase, phase 7. Now this phase is relatively simple and more of a victory lap. We got Exa Flares, Akamon Towers, Giga Flares with proximity AoEs, in and outs, tank swaps and baited auto attacks. And that's the phase in a nutshell, but it's pretty cool the first few times you do it, and actually becomes a bit of a chill experience once you have a few clears under your belt. I really enjoyed the aspect of tanking this phase because it requires multiple tank swaps and you can't rely on Shirk for every single one of them. More active tanking responsibilities is always a plus in my books, especially when you're taking away stuff from me like positioning and ad phases. Overall, DSR is a hell of a solid fight. You can tell it's a step in modernizing ultimate fights, design-wise, but it does it in such a well-presented way with a lot of recoverable mechanics and enough punishment to not make it too easy. On top of having a really good story, there is a good reason DSR is considered one of the best ultimate fights in Final Fantasy XIV. But Dragon Song of Prize wasn't the only ultimate added in Endwalker. Endwalker also saw the addition of the Omega Protocol, which was the second ultimate raid added in Endwalker. And it had its problems. This fight also made me want to quit the game after I finished progressing it and clearing it week 5. But I've since gone back and got myself 20 plus kills and thoroughly enjoy the fight. But you might call this Stockholm Syndrome, because this fight honestly sucks, to be completely honest. Phase 1 begins with Beta Omega and the mechanic Looper, which requires the brain to be switched on from the get-go. A single lapse in judgement could cause a wipe. Maybe you forget your movement priority, maybe you forget to take your tower or tether, or maybe you confuse your debuffs for taking the tower or tether first, and then it's over before you know it. Pantocrator is maybe a little bit more laid back, but it's still hectic and requires adjustment. And that's the name of the game when it comes to top. Adjustment. Because you'll be doing this a lot. Phase 2, possibly my favourite phase, begins with Omega M and F, and arguably has the hardest mechanic in the entire fight, Pi Synergy. It's a fun, fast-paced mechanic that requires you to think quickly 
avoid the Omega attacks, then orientate yourself based on the eye, figure out the safe spot, and move to where you need to be depending on your PlayStation symbol and if it's close or far. The thing that ruins this mechanic for me is just how shit close feels. Because even though it's considered the close version of the two, if you're too close, you'll get a vulnerability and die to optimized fire. If you're too far, you'll get a vulnerability and die to optimized fire. So you have to be the perfect distance. Very annoying and is definitely intended, but that doesn't excuse how bad it feels. The rest of the phase is nothing special, although some adjustments may be needed if two players on the same side get a stack. Phase 3 begins with this weird intermission that gives everyone debuffs and requires the group to spread out while dodging the Omega AoEs and his fists. Pretty cool way to handle a transition, but unfortunately the same can be said for Phase 3 itself, which is honestly a pretty lame phase. It starts with Hello World and just repeats the same mechanic over four times until everyone has had a turn with Tether's defamation and stacks, and that's really it. It's fun as a healer, I guess, but I really do wish they mixed it up with something more here. After that, it's monitors, and these are kind of unique, so I'll give them that, but it's nothing crazy once you have the know-how. As a fun fact, Omega here used to start this phase by immediately auto-attacking, and it was almost impossible for a tank to get aggro, so this auto usually landed on a DPS or healer. And after the intermission phase, everyone was really low, so this forced even more healer mitigation on something that seems so stupid. This was later deemed as a bug and patched out. Then once we kill Omega for the third time, he enters phase 4 where he resets his HP and targets everyone with spreads, two random players with stacks, and does the same AoEs from the intermission phase. Nothing really creative here, other than this phase almost always needing a melee limit break free in most cases. Either way, we need to get Omega past 20% here to meet the DPS check. After he casts blue screen, we enter phase 5, and this is where the fun begins. I wish. Delta, the first mechanic, is pretty fun. It smartly gives everyone tethers and baited fists that need to be paired for the opposite color. The fists on the outside of the arena also need to be baited, and the Omega in the middle also needs to be baited. And then the final Omega uses monitors that need to be taken by two players, and a random player also gets a monitor that they need to hit with two players with their monitor, but not the same two players as final Omega is hitting. After that, two players have close and distant rod that need to position themselves to the safe side of Beetle Omega, while the rest of the players need to bait the close and distant rod to collect Dynamo stacks. <sighs> Yeah, it's a lot, but it's done in such a way that once you know your tether and the initial starting position, then you know what you're doing from the start to finish of this mechanic. And that's very cool, and I wish I could say the same for the following two mechanics, but I can't. Which is sadly just resolved through either an auto marker plugin or another player marking people to delegate them to certain positions. My group did the latter with myself and my co-tank both marking players. It was just infinitely easier to do this than having a priority system for everyone to worry about. The problem is this is just bad design. It's basically one or two players having an understanding of the mechanic while the rest just do what they've been told to do. Why is this the case when you've got the first mechanic done so well with Tevis dictating who is baiting? But in this case, the variables for who goes where is, well, quite varied, which has sadly just led to the rampant use of a plugin to do the mechanic for them. And when that doesn't work, they run around like headless chicken, and I don't know if I can even blame them. It's just a bad mechanic and really spoils this phase for me because the auto markers just tell you what to do. Or if you just had a player marking, they would be telling you what to do. If they just had Sigma and Omega have something similar to Delta with Tevas, then this wouldn't be an issue. But as it stands now, this phase is just badly designed. Also, fun fact number two, this fight also had an auto attack straight after Sigma that killed the main tank if they took a later bait, which meant we had to forcefully make the main tank take the first bait of a close or distant roll to avoid this. It was also later fixed in a patch. Anyway, vent over, let's talk about phase six, the final phase. Well, to get here, you need everyone to have three dynamo stacks each, then Omega cast a raid wide that needs to be tank limit break freed. This converts the free dynamo stacks into a buff that serves as a permanent tank limit break free that you'll need to survive the mechanics and also gives a free limit break free once you use your limit break free. However, if you die, you'll lose this buff and the run is pretty much doomed, making this final phase one of the most punishing ultimate final phases since UCOB. But just like any final phase, the mechanics themselves are pretty simple. We got extra squares, extra flares, protein spreads, stacks, and tank busters. The thing that makes this phase unique is closer to the end where the limit break spam comes in. These meteors spawn that need to be cast limit breaked, then the physical range needs to limit break the two remaining meteors, then after some other stuff, a mega uses a raid wide that needs to be tank limit breaked, then the raid wide leaves a debuff on everyone that needs to be cleansed with healer limit break free, and then Mega repeats the raid wide, and then we repeat the limit breaks. And then he casts his enrage, and we kill him before he kills us. 
Then the fight is over, and the Omega Protocol is no more, and thank f for that. I was extremely satisfied with clearing this fight, but even though it didn't take me as long to clear as DSR, I went on a several week long break from the game in a desperate need of a change of environment. I haven't felt that way since T. I'm hopeful that going into Dawn Trail, I'll be more open to the idea of using Party Finder to get some additional through clears, but I guess that depends on my enjoyment of the fight. Either way, that's the ultimate raids of Endwalker covered. Overall, I think they did a really good job here, making some of the most challenging fights Final Fantasy XIV has to offer. Yeah, Top has its issues, but I don't think it's the worst fight ever, and whatever top lacks, DSR more than makes up for it. Other than adding two ultimate fights, Enderwalker also took a risk with Variant and Criterion dungeons, and this piece of content is quite promising, although there are some things I'd like to see improved with this content going forward. Variant dungeons are a very casual oriented piece of content, and I think that's perfectly fine. In fact, I love this content. It's extremely laid back, and you can get some really nice rewards from it. My only problem is, once you've done all 12 paths, there isn't really any reason to go back and do a variant dungeon, other than maybe farming the rewards to sell on the market board. Which is a good enough reason to a degree, but I just wish for a little bit more of an incentive. Maybe something like a duty roulette, or a weekly, or something. Give me a reason to run this every once in a while, is all I'm asking. Maybe it's a me problem for doing all 12 paths in a single day on a release, but still, I can't be the only one who does this, right? Anyway, what I really want to focus on is Criterion Dungeons, the step up from Variant. And it's not a small step either. The mechanic in Criterions are hard, punishing, and quite thought-provoking, but they are fantastic encounters. Each Criterion dungeon offers a similar experience. A few trash pulls, a boss fight, another set of trash, and then boss fight into boss fight. The trash pulls, I think, are good, but also quite annoying. They definitely add to the experience of actually feeling like a dungeon, and I wouldn't want them removed, but they are the most problematic when it comes to overall enjoyment. Still, the boss fights are where Criterion really shine. As Criterion Dungeons are only 4 players, 1 tank, 1 healer, and 2 DPS, it allows the mechanics a lot more freedom in how they present themselves, and makes for some pretty unique mechanics in general. That said, they aren't perfect with their mechanical consistency, with some patterns to mechanics being harder than others, which I'm honestly just not a fan of. If you can't make a mechanic almost equally as difficult or easy with a different pattern that may or may not happen, then find a better solution to making a mechanic but that's just a personal problem that becomes more elevated by Criterion fight design. Then of course you have Savage, and this is just like normal Criterion, except dying here is permanent and you have to restart over at the very start if someone dies. Well, theoretically you don't have to, but if someone does die anywhere other than at the very end, where they are maybe no longer needed, then it's almost guaranteed to be a wipe. As for the content itself, I really like Criterion as a piece of content, and I'm super glad to know it's coming back in Dawn Trail. And it makes me hopeful with what they did with a lower lowers rewards being alternative max time level weapons with unique visual effects. I do wish they would do more with it though, when it comes to rewards. Maybe an alternative max item level right side to add more variety to accessories and solve the issue of only having two rings to pick from at max item level. Going back and doing Sildeen and Rock and Savage is also just nigh pointless after doing it once, which sucks because it's fun content but there is literally no reason, no reward, no achievement, and the currency you get from doing Savage is the exact same from normal. So if you did want to do Sildeen or Rockin again, you're better off just doing it in normal mode for the currency. Either way, really good content, and the fight designers should be proud of themselves for what they have made here, but it just doesn't have enough buzz or community around it to keep it active. So let's hope they listen to the feedback from Endwalker and improve upon it in Dawn Trail to make this content enjoyed by more people, because I can see this content having a dedicated community just like Deep Dungeon and Exploration Zones once they have more desirable rewards tied to it. Hell, maybe they could even add a scoring system which would entice people to do this content. I could see this having something like a dedicated speedrunning scene, but only time will tell, and and all we can do is remain hopeful. With all that talked about, let's wind down a bit and talk more on the casual side of things, and start with the alliance raids. When I first heard we're fighting the 12 in these alliance raids, I was absolutely stoked, but after going through them all and giving them much thought, these were mostly a complete letdown, but let me explain. The first raid, Aglir, was nothing short of amazing. The first boss, Byragot, had this quirky mechanic with his hammers that knocked the platforms by one block, but not the players themselves, and this got so many people knocked off including myself. The second boss, Rauga, had multiple knockback mechanics that, if handled incorrectly, could very well much result in players falling off the arena and dying. The third boss, Azima, had a lot of avoiding fire, which was fitting for the god of fire, but it was very chaotic and fun. And the fourth boss, Nad Fol, had this really cool ad phase where the entire alliance had to work together to keep the balance, to avoid a complete raid wipe. Quite punishing for a 24-player alliance raid, but it made it so much more enjoyable. 
Now that's every uglier boss in a nutshell, but overall the raid was just really solid. It wasn't anything crazy, but you were punished for messing up, and I think that's good. Alliance raid doesn't need to be anything sort of hard, but having a little bit of punishment here and there is never a bad thing, and gives players the opportunity to actually learn and grow from it, which is always a good thing in my books. So imagine my disappointment when Yothrasine came out and just did not meet any of my expectations. The first boss, amazing design, 10 out of 10, exactly how I imagined her, and the mechanics were very fitting to her overall theme, but man it just had barely any punishment to it. You'd at most get a vulnerability set up, maybe get downed if you messed up a second time, but that's really it. The mechanics here were like, super obvious, no real mystery other than experiencing the in and out mechanic. The second boss, Affleck and Nimia, were actually pretty cool. It had an rage, but the entire alliance would have to be really bad to ever see that. As for the mechanics themselves, well, Nimia either did a pyretic or freeze, or look away and look at, which was cool, but she only did one of those sets throughout the encounter, and it was random which one she did. I would have preferred if she just used all four mechanics, but that's just me. The neat thing here is if you did f up, Affleck would do a cleave, and if you were frozen or charmed by Nimia's mechanic, it would be instant death, which I found quite a good punishment to learn from. The third boss, Halone was actually pretty cool. A lot of dodging and memorizing the order of mechanics, but my only problem with her again is just the lack of punishment here. Really, the only thing that's ever killed me on this fight is the proximity AoE, and that's just because I'm a greedy mother Otherwise, the fight just lacks punishment, which is a shame because Halone is my favorite of the 12, and I really wanted them to go wild with her, but oh well. And the final boss was just not it for me. The only really cool gimmick here was the moons, but again, these were obvious as hell. The avoidable AoEs were incredibly obvious too, and the ad phase was needless filler. Even worse, after the ad phase, she summons her pet Doggo, and I really expected more from this, but all it did was add in an extra AoE to dodge, and that was it. This was a disappointing experience for sure, and overall just didn't live up to the expectation that I hoped for for this alliance raid coming from Aglia, but maybe the next alliance raid can redeem it. Well, no, it didn't. The first block only cool feature was the spinning mechanic, and that was easy enough to figure out. Limia, the second boss, also just didn't really impress me. She felt like a watered down Haloni, but at least the kiss interaction was pretty neat. And Oshchon, the third boss, wasn't anything special either, but at this point it felt like they were running out of ideas. It just didn't engage or slightly challenge my brain at all. The only thing that might be considered hard here is figuring out where the safe spot is when he clones himself, but it's fairly obvious. And then the final boss was just a combination of every previous boss put into one, with the only standout mechanic being the free fist that you have to track and follow, which I actually find pretty neat, but other than that it's just everything we've already seen before. Maybe I'm way too harsh coming from the perspective of a savage and ultimate raider, and expecting too much of a challenge, and I'll admit, I do have a bias here but I have strong opinions of what this type of content's goals should be. It's got 24 players. The least you can do is punish individual players for stupid mistakes and maybe teach them that raid wides happen and they're normal and okay. I'm not asking for alliance raids to last an hour or more, but I do wonder why they even have two hours of duty time if they don't expect them to at least last a little bit with some hiccups. As for the story, well, I'm glad it clears up even more Asian mystery. I do question the decision to kill the gods, but apparently it's not going to bear any consequences, so there's that. With all that said, there is still a lot of mystery surrounding the Ancients or Asians. Myths of the Realm and Pandemonium definitely answered a lot of questions, but there's still a lot to know, and I wonder if they'll leave this to personal interpretation, or will they further explore their lore in Dauntree and beyond? And only time will tell. Alright, I saved this for one of my last points, and I'm not going to talk about it too much because I'm kind of half and half on it. That being job design. The one and only time I'll compare Endwalker to another expansion is now, because it's unavoidable, and it's how Endwalker just built upon what Shadowbringers already laid out and didn't really bring anything new to the table in terms of job design, except changing any remaining 90 second or 180 second cooldowns into 60 or 120 second cooldowns, with a few survivors like Riddle of Wind and Salted Earth. Otherwise, every other offensive cooldown is just a 60 second or 120 second cooldown, and Endwalker just didn't do anything new or exciting for job design at all, except adding a few new skills, which is fun, I guess. The main problem with this low is just how much Endwalker focused on the 2 minute meta, which has a lot of problems to it. For starters, dying during the 2 minute meta burst f sucks and that's the majority of your damage, just gone. Gameplay is mostly unengaging for a lot of jobs until you're in the 2 minute burst window, where it's fun for about 20 seconds and then goes back to unengaging and the fights being specifically designed around the 2 minute burst window, enforcing mechanics during the window to make those mechanics artificially more difficult. It feels more exciting when job design is more chaotic and fight design isn't tailored around the burst window, but rather a fight just throwing random bullshit at you when you're doing the equivalent of the 2 minute burst window but within 90 second cooldowns instead. So maybe it would affect only some jobs, but this would just make things 
more enjoyable and give a different experience and perspective to different jobs depending on the fight, which creates a varied experience for all players. Alas, I'm also just a support main, mainly playing tank and a bit of healer, and I don't particularly care too much about how engaging my job is, at least to a degree. All I want is interesting fight design when it comes to playing tanks. Give me more boss positioning and adds to handle like P3S. Give me more cooldown management and stress like P10S. Really, that's all I care about. But I do hope I can provide a voice of reason for those that want these changes when it comes to the 2 minute meta. It just gets boring after a while. And sure, it has its pros of being easier to play. But easier doesn't always mean better. And when things just progressively become easier and easier, you're just going to piss off your core veteran player base. And one day those new players who only just got into the game will also be part of that player base and parade this same concern. The job design is getting too stale and too easy and it does need to change going forward. Anyway, that's enough about job design and a two minute battle. Let's talk about some miscellaneous content Ed Walker added throughout its patches, starting with Island Sanctuary. <sighs> Island Sanctuary is definitely a piece of content that Ed Walker added. No, but honestly, it did show promise initially, being this fun little island resort. It gave us the impression of an Animal Crossing light minigame. Collecting resources, capturing animals, building a hub up, it was exciting. But it just ended up being this hollow spreadsheet simulator where you'd look at the best possible workshop crafts and send your foraging team to gather the most in-demand materials for said crafts. And you really don't do much else outside of that. You can go out and gather resources, but it's painfully slow and takes forever to rank you up. You're better off just being patient and ranking up for upgrading your hub and workshop crafts. And resources for your mammoth's foraging. And the animal capturing mechanic could have been a lot cooler, with maybe some rewards tied to it for capturing and collecting the rare animals, but instead collecting rare animals did nothing more than just give you more materials used for workshop crafts, which is just kind of lame. It has nice cosmetic rewards to the content, but it stops there. You do this content for the cosmetics and then you forget about it, and sadly that's it. There was a lot of potential here, but sadly it was missed. However, they are continuing this lifestyle content going into Dawn Trail, taking from Island Sanctuary and each Guardian Restoration, so maybe with the combination of the two we can see some real improvements made to this type of content. Eureka Office is another piece of content I'd like to briefly talk about. It's the third installment to Deep Dungeons and potentially one of the most controversial. Eureka Office has some problems, but let's talk about the positives first to start with. It's very beginner friendly to people who haven't done too much Deep Dungeon yet, and is a great starting point to learn the fundamentals to this content. When soloing, time really won't be an issue here, nor will DPS checks or enemies hitting too hard. No, instead the real challenge you'll face here in Eureka Office is the mobs being very mechanical in what they do and having a lot of one-shot mechanics in place for failures. The mechanics aren't necessarily Really hard to understand though, which does make it very welcoming to newcomers wanting to get their feet wet into soloing this type of content. And it even got me into this content, and then I proceeded to solo Palace of the Dead and Heaven on High. So it set out to get more people into Deep Dungeon, and it did a good job at that. But what it didn't do a good job at is appeasing the current Deep Dungeon enjoyers, as it didn't really add anything new for them, and in fact felt a little backwards with extremely tanky early floors, mobs that didn't hit very hard, or have any form of DPS checks, and this meant commander management meant very little here. Now I'm no deep dungeon expert, so forgive me in this department, but it definitely would have been nice if Eureka Orphus managed to strike a nice middle ground by getting more people into this content while bringing something new to the table for the current fanbase, which sadly it just didn't. But it's been confirmed that we're getting another deep dungeon in Dauntra, so I remain hopeful in this regard as I believe it's important to keep each and every community happy within the game. Speaking of keeping every community happy, we have PvP, and this piece of content has changed so much over the course of the years, but I honestly really like its current iteration with Crystalline Conflict that came with Endwalker, and all the job changes. I think they have a solid format for PvP with this one. Although I stick to casual because I'm not much of a PvPer, I do have to admit it kind of sucks there isn't any way to queue with my friends or even do a daily roulette. I'm really unsure why the daily roulette is so underutilized when it comes to content that could really stand to benefit from it, but I digress. The rewards here are really cool as well with the new trophy crystal currency. My only complaint is the Surrey Malmstones. For being a subscription-based MMORPG, I don't think this kind of stuff should be locked behind FOMO, so I'd love to see an option to either be able to progress old Surrey's Malmstone retroactively, or be able to purchase the old rewards with trophy crystals, which to a degree would make people who missed out on the Malmstone rewards have to work harder for the rewards, but at least there would still be a feasible way to obtain these rewards even if you missed out on them by either taking a break from the game or you just weren't playing Final Fantasy XIV at the time. And no, I haven't missed out on a single Malmstone stone reward. I'm simply giving this criticism because I think it would stand to benefit to the overall player base as a whole. Maybe we can see something like this in the future, but I kind of doubt it with the approach they've taken to PvP in the past, having a plethora of rewards that simply just aren't obtainable anymore. Oh right, and relics. 
They suck. No, but really. I'm sure you've heard all this bullshit I'm about to spew already, so I'll keep it brief. It's hard not to compare previous expansions here. The real grind is having to do all the Hildebrand quests if you haven't already. Outside of that, you can acquire these relics by just collecting tomes, which have a positive of being able to farm relics any way you want, but it has a negative of just not feeling very fulfilling upon obtaining a relic. Ah well. At least in Dawn Trail, all of these relics will require is poetic tomes to acquire. Still, this didn't feel like a good set of relic steps to keep us busy during the expansion cycle, but I remain hopeful for Dawn Trail's relic step. And the last thing I want to talk about is Adventure Place. This is actually a fantastic system and adds so much personality to your character and profile, being able to pose any way you want as long as you have the MO and customizing your place with styles you've unlocked throughout doing content. It's just a great way to express yourself and personal expression is really important to an MMORPG, so I have to give props to this idea. It's not all positives though. Even though Adventure Place is a brilliant system and idea, it does have its problems in how the smallest change to your character is prone to breaking your portraits without you realizing it until you enter a duty and realize your character has a mugshot. Annoying, and it has been an issue for a while, but maybe this is something that can be amended in the future, or maybe this is simply a user error and we need to stop complaining about the smallest things, although I do feel like this complaint is valid, because it's annoying. And oh my god, that's literally everything in Endwalker there is to talk about. You know, I promised myself not to write another essay video, and what do I do? Write another f***ing essay video. Just before Dawn Trail! I have Shadow of Erdtree to be playing instead, but I'll probably be editing this long last video. Ugh. Anyway, vent aside, I have a conclusion to say. Endwalker is a good expansion. I've said it before, I'll say it again. It isn't the best, but it's not bad either. It has a ton of content included with it. It took risks with Criterion and Iron Sanctuary, but it also didn't take some risks. The job design being one of them, the relics another, and it had a complete lack of exploration zone which, let's face it, hurt the longevity of this expansion. All the things I'm sure you've heard of many times before. But maybe in the off chance someone at Square Enix at least watches and listens to this video, and maybe even acknowledges it. Or maybe if you just enjoyed hearing my thoughts, and that's honestly enough to make me happy to get this video out. With all that said, I have one last thing to talk about. Endwalker is dearly a true expansion to me. It's the expansion I decided to say, f*** it. I'm going to start making content for this game. I've been playing it for 10 years. Do I wish I made content sooner? Yeah, I do. But I'm glad I started with Endwalker. It had a lot to talk about and a lot to learn and grow as from a creator's perspective. I wasn't invited to the Dawn Trails media tour, so I didn't get to play the expansion early and make content out of it like my fellow peers did. But I'm genuinely happy for them as they worked hard for that, and I'm going to work hard for the opportunity next expansion. Still, I want to say thank you, Endwalker. You may not have been the best expansion, but to me, you'll always be the dearest one, and the one where my journey truly began. And thank you for taking the time for watching this video. I'll see you in Dawn Trail, or maybe you're already there, in which case I hope you're enjoying it. Anyway, see you later, and goodbye.